welcome everybody. I, I guess Patrick might have welcomed people already, but welcome. Um, we've just been talking about Sue Hespos and Sydney, and the reason for that is that we're very fortunate that uh, Sue will be joining us at um, Mark's Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development uh, as soon as possible, as soon as uh, the uh, pandemic allows, um, maybe at least by the end of the, uh, by the middle of next year. So let me let me uh, give you a bit of background. Professor Sue Hespos leads an infancy research group of the psychology department at Northwestern University. Sue received her doctoral degree in psychology from Emory University in 1996. And in 2001, she was appointed assistant professor of psychology and human development at Vanderbilt University before joining Northwestern in 2005. Sue's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation for the past 15 years. And her work is published widely in top journals in cognitive and developmental psychology, including Nature, Proceedings in National Academy, Psychological Science and Cognition. Sue's research focuses on early conceptual abilities and how thinking lays the foundation for adult reasoning, a true lifespan approach, but with an emphasis on infancy. In her study of humans, um, of how humans represent everyday entities like objects, space and, event, and events, she investigates what infants understand about how objects behave. And the first links between words and objects are really crucial sort of uh, uh, nexus of, of, of development. Her current work focuses mainly on um, this area and explores the ability to represent substance like liquids um, and the ability to make relational comparisons between objects and events. The results shed light on basic principles that guide cognition and learning, not only in infants, but through the lifespan. So today, Sue is going to tell us about her infancy work, but again, in relation to lifespan development. And the topic is, some things don't change, emphasising continuity through development. Over to you, Sue. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Dennis. I, um, hmm. I'm going to try to share my screen successfully. Here we go. Hang on. Let me do that one more time. Oh, it was on share sound. OK. All right. Can somebody give me a shout out that that works? Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Okay. Um, I just want to arrange things. All right. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for inviting me to this conference. Um, as we said at the beginning, uh, well, I wish it could be live, but all of our lives have had to adjust relatively recently. Um, as far as ground rules for this talk, I would really appreciate it if you all would interrupt me if you have questions. Um, I know it's a diverse group with, a, um, with many different backgrounds. And if you have clarification questions, um, please put them in the chat room or interrupt me. My graduate student, Aporva Shivaram, is here and she has promised to watch the chat for me. Um, and she's not afraid to interrupt me. So, um, <laughs> and if you have a quick question, she might be able to just answer it in the chat as well. So um, without further ado, I will get going. Um, okay, so my ticket is to look at the origins of our uniquely human abilities and to see how they function prior to much influence of language and culture. I'm going to start with my take home message, which is always um, that infants think before they speak. And here's a demonstration of exactly that from a six month old infant. Okay, 
So this is an example of a behavior that was not intentionally trained. It is a six month old infant who um, nevertheless has some really clear expectations. Mom's no nose should not ever make that kind of noise. And, um, and the kid has a range of responses. One, infants look at things that captivate their attention that they find interesting or surprising. Um, and this kid is beautifully expressive, right? You know, the, um, the absolute shock and fear that is in, um, in their face at the beginning, but also the, um, the awesome belly laugh and the emotional display um, as well. So I think that there are many people that agree that this can show you that, um, that infants have expectations about things that events that are going on in their world. And um, so this is what I find interesting to study. I think that um, that infants are actively engaged in their environment. And more specifically, if we can specify the nature of young infants' abilities, we'll be in a better position to do two things. One, um, we'll better understand how language can capitalize on pre-existing cognitive abilities. And two, we, um, we'll better understand how these abilities relate to the cognitive abilities of other species. So the research that I'm gonna show you today will reveal new insights about the nature and representational abilities that emerge early in development and the ones that I'm going to talk about today in particular um, sort of show that there's continuity through development. So um, now that we have demonstrated that um, infants have expectations about events in their world, um, the next question is, how does someone ask a preverbal infant a question? So um, we use looking paradigms. Um, these type of paradigms have been in use for about 30 years in the field. And, um, and I'm gonna just give you a short example of how they kind of work. An infant will sit on their parent's lap in front of something that looks like a puppet stage. Um, there's usually a video camera underneath the stage videotaping the infant's face and playing it for students in another room who are pressing buttons when the kid is attending to what's going on on stage and letting go of that button when the kids should look away. Um, so um, this was a study that was done by Liz Spelke in the early 90s. There was a hand that was holding this um, yellow object this yellow ball right here. And um, the experimenter would roll the ball to the other side of the stage. So, um, and then their other hand would catch the ball on the other side of the stage and it would roll backwards, uh, back and forth and back and forth. Now infants will look at this event. It's not the most exciting puppet stage in the world, puppet show in the world, but they look at it for a while. And if they look away for two consecutive seconds, then the experimenter will lower the screen and go on to the next trial. So infants pick up on this contingency in a very few number of trials, and you sort of build an expectation with the infant. They look when they're interested, they look away when they're bored, and this is how we can ask kids questions. So you show them various familiarization trials with the ball going back and forth. Then you, um, in some experiments, you wait until there's a decline in looking, a habituation, or the kids get a little bit bored. Um, after they meet a certain criteria and you go on to test trials. In the test trials, perceptually in this particular experiment, it was very similar. The only thing that was switched out was the screens. So now instead of one large red screen, there are two um, narrow screens and the ball, the hand throws, you know, goes back and forth, catching the ball and rolling it back and forth again. And so, um, so you would record looking time at a, an expected test trial like this one and compare it to an unexpected test trial, which perceptually is very similar, but you'll notice there's one important difference. The ball manages to blink in and out of existence in between the two occluders. And so um, if kids understand, hey, this isn't what happens to objects in the real, real world, they may look longer at these unexpected test trials compared to the expected test trials. And lo and behold, that's what they found. Infants look significantly longer at the unexpected test trial as early as three months of age in this particular study. And so doing experiments like this, also with you know, the requisite control conditions and things like that, we can ask preverbal infants questions. And, um, and so, now um, that I've shown you that babies have expectations and how you can ask infants questions, um, the next question that I wanna ask is, um, why would you want to ask babies questions? Why do you care why, what babies think prior to speaking? Um, well, I tend to think that the origins of knowledge are really important. Um, as a developmental psychologist, we often map out what changes and what stays the same over the course of development. And there isn't one coherent 
theory that captures all of the things that infants are acquiring in, in terms of their knowledge in the first um, months, years of life. So for example, many of us were schooled in the Piagetian notion of stage-like development. And it doesn't really matter if this is like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade in terms of cognitive abilities a la Piaget's stage-like theory, um, or it could also be like their stages of object permanence over the first year of life. Um, the important point about Piaget's theory was that there were stages of relative plateaus of homostasis, and then they were interrupted by cognitive reorganization and dramatic change. Um, now, decades of research have agreed and disagreed with Piaget's approach. Um, uh, there's another approach called developmental tuning. This approach has been found in a lot of research on speech perception, face perception, and even in neuroscience, um, in the neuroscience approach, there's sort of examples in terms of the number of synaptic connections that you have. There's exuberant growth in the first couple of months of life. And then there's a gradual pruning, a use it or lose it sort of phenomena in terms of the synapses that get used often um, get myelinated and, and there's more, um, they, they get strengthened and, uh, and the other ones fall away. Now, I'm not actually going to talk about either of these developmental curves today. I'm going to talk about one that is a continuity form of development. The um, continuity theory suggests that there are some aspects of development that are continuous and that the developmental change over time is one of elaboration and refinement. So one example of that is visual perception. So if I were to hold this pen in front of my face, my visual experience of that pen has a lot in common with the way that a three month old would visually experience that pen as well. So for example, like the exa uh, example from the beginning, I don't think this pen will blink in and out of existence and neither does a three month old infant, even as it moves around. Um, okay, so the goal here is not to say that one theory is right and therefore the other theory, theory fails, but to acknowledge that there's room for multiple perspectives. The best scientists are the ones that have the flexibility to entertain their own data and how their own data might look from multiple different theoretical perspectives and why. All right, with that sort of groundwork laid, I'm going to talk about a uniquely powerful relational ability that only humans seem to have, namely analogical comparison. So analogical comparison is defined as the ability to make relational comparisons between objects, events, or even abstract things like ideas. Um, this analogical processing ability is the key capacity supporting higher order cognition. It, it supports abstract categories. It supports learning abstract rules. It is also a key capacity that may differentiate humans from other non-human primates and other species in general. Um, it is this, uh, the, it is that the adult relational ability is pretty astounding and it, Several decades of research, um, largely uh, done by a variety of different labs, um, show that there are many things that contribute to adults' sophisticated ability. It's their rich representations, it's their powerful processing abilities. Um, and, uh, but what the data that I'm gonna talk about today is gonna fill a gap in the literature. The gap that we're gonna fill is that if, you're, if you believe in a continuity theory of development, it will be instructive to look at the earliest signs of analogical reasoning or relational um, learning in infancy because it may inform us about aspects of the adult ability. So um, we are gonna, to gain insight to the nature and the origins of our amazing analogical abilities, we're gonna look at infants and see how this ability emerges. All right, so just to sort of lay out a theoretical, um, range uh, or continuum here. There, um, how does this human relational learning ability arise? There's basically three possible ways to talk about this in terms of a continuum. At one end of the continuum is this notion that we're born with a set of privileged relations that are, um, that are naturally used to encode our experience. So um, it would sort of, uh, you know, a primitive re relational um, ability would be to, the ability to detect same and different. Now, a second sort of more middle of the road approach is this idea that we're sure we're born with a relational processing ability, but the environment is going to provide um, the 
the relations that we detect, the learning opportunities. Um, and it's distinct from the first position because infants would be unable to spontaneously encode something like a same different relation from a single exemplar. But that we have this ability really early in development to acquire relations. Um, we just need to be able to compare across multiple exemplars and any of the relations that our environment provides, we can detect and abstract. And then the third position is this idea that relational processes are uniquely human. As a matter of fact, they're an outcropping of language and culture, and it's the combinatorial power of having these symbolic systems that allows us to have our relational ability. And so it's a later emerging process, and we wouldn't find any evidence of it in infancy. So this is a range of possibilities that I'm going to be revisiting throughout the talk. Um, so it, um, uh, let me just go back. I am rooting for the one in the middle. <laughs> and so this is the one that I'm going to be arguing for. Um, the, uh, the theory backing up this middle um, uh, uh, possibility comes from structure mapping theory. Um, I've been working for years now with Deidre Gentner, and the work that I'm presenting today is the, out, uh, the output of a, a great collaboration that we've had for quite some time. So structure mapping theory provides a mechanism for explaining how we detect relational mappings. If, um, if we have two entities depicted here by these red hierarchies, um, we can draw comparisons about their relational structures. We can say, hey, this node is like this one, and this one maps onto this one, and this one maps onto this one. So for example, say you're a kid and somebody's labeled the one on the left as a horse, and you're trying to decide if the one on the right is also a horse. So what you could do is you could draw comparisons about their shape and their size and the way they move and recognize that they're either closely aligned and draw the conclusion that they're both horses or that they're completely different and, um, and it must be something else. Um, now these comparisons, these um, mappings can be as concrete as comparing two objects that are sitting there right in front of you or as abstract as comparing something like an atom is really a lot like a solar system. They have object correspondences like the sun to the nucleus and the planet to the electron. They also have common relational structures like the planet revolves around the sun just like the um, the electron revolves around the nucleus and both of them are due to an attractive force between them. So, um, so it can range from concrete to abstract. And, um, and this is the mechanism that we think is responsible for informing relational learning. Um, so another really cool thing about the structure mapping idea is that if you've got this hierarchy on the left and it's got this extra part down on the bottom, it allows you to map that onto an analogous example and Per, um, and make inferences, say, gosh, what would this one look like if it had this extension to it? What would the implications of that be? So what we wanna do is, um, is ask, how has this relational ability been tested in adults and in children? Um, so to get started on that, these abilities have been tested in primates as well as human children using something called the relational match to sample task. Um, so here, what you do is you present, um, children with a target that has two objects. So namely AA in this particular example. And you say to the kid, look, this is your target. And, um, and then you present them with two cards that have, one has XX on it and one has YZ on it. And you ask the kid, which one goes with the target over here? Now, if the kids are gonna pick up the relation between the letters, they're gonna say, oh, this is a relation of same. This is a relation of same. This one XX must be the one that goes with the target. Similarly, if you give a kid BC, they should pick YZ over XX, right? So there shouldn't be a difference between these two things. They can detect same relations, they can detect different relations. Um, and what we find is that very few children under the age of four pass this task. Um, as a matter of fact, there, um, this task, non, um, very few non-human primates have ever passed this task. The only ones that uh, did were a select few that were symbol trained and they needed multiple trials. So clearly this is a difficult task and infants would not succeed at it. Consequently, we're gonna focus on a precursor to this ability that asks the question of, can infants learn to discriminate between same and different pairs of objects? So what we're gonna do is this, it, um, is we're gonna habituate infants to a relation of same and then after they've shown a decline in looking over repeated presentations of a same relation, we're going to alternate between showing them same and different responses in test trials. Now, if they've gotten bored with the relation same, then they should look longer at different during test trials. Similarly, if we habituate them to a different relation, they should look longer at same during test trials. 
So, um, so this is uh, this was our initial task. Um, could infants possibly learn how to discriminate between same and different? Now, before going on to this, I want to briefly sketch out some of the developmental evidence for relational learning in children. So. What we know from work with children is uh, there are a couple signatures to relational learning. There are things that can facilitate the learning and there are things that can hinder the learning. So as developmental psychologists, we are often trying to help children learn, but the sort of evil developmental psychologist in all of us is also just as interested in what hinders that learning process. And so, um, so let me give you examples of both of those here. If you present a kid with the relational match to sample task, they fail if they're younger than four years of age. However, kids that are a little younger than four can succeed if you do this sort of variation. If you present the kid with multiple exemplars, first you show them AA, then you show them BB, then you show them CC, and then you ask, okay, which one goes with these up here? They're gonna select XX, okay? So the comparison across those three exemplars allows them to perceive the, um, the invariant relation and, and detect it during test trials. Um, so that facilitates learning. Here's something that interferes with learning. If you present them with the target and one of your test objects shares an object with an object in the target, this is really distracting to their ability to perceive the relation. Basically, you would hope that they would say, oh, this is the same relation, I should go with this one. But essentially what happens is that the kids look at this and they say, this has got an A in it, and this has got an A in it, it must be that these two go together. So this is a common mistake or a way to interfere with the ability to detect the relation. Um, a third example is that language helps. Um, if you show three-year-olds, hey, this one's a blicket, and this one's also a blicket. Can you find the blicket down here? They will choose XX over YZ. So these are some of the signatures that we've seen in experiments on uh, toddlers and preschoolers that show things that are signatures of the, of the, of the process, and we're going to see whether or not these are there in infants as well. So what we did, and now one thing is... Um, when we were asking this question of whether or not infants can distinguish pairs from same pairs from different pairs, um, the first possibility, remember the poss range of possibilities I described at the beginning, is that same and different are part of the core set of relations. Now, back way back in 1991, Terrell and his colleagues published a widely cited paper that said this was the case. They used a preferential looking paradigm and they reported that seven month old infants encode same and diff different relations without any training, that they do it spontaneously. Now, 1991 was early days for looking paradigms and it's been a long time since then. So when we started out this study, we thought it would be a great idea to maybe replicate this study first. So they studied nine, uh, they studied nine month olds in the original study. Uh, no, they studied seven month olds in the original study. We frankly didn't believe that the seven month olds would do it. And so we tested seven and nine month old infants. We used a preferential looking paradigm. We presented the infants with one exemplar and then we gave them a test of whether or not they'd prefer this, um, uh, the novel relation. Um, the dependent variable was infants looking time during test trials. And there's two types of test trials, a concrete and, a firm, um, and an abstract. I will give you a, a picture of this so it's easier for you to um, imagine. So in the, uh, in the experiment, what we did was we familiarized infants to same. This was based on as far as we could replicate the Terrell study. So we put two identical fish on one side of the screen. The, the puppet stage, stage uh, screen was lifted up. There's two fish on the left side of the stage and it was up there for 20 seconds. Then the screen goes down after 20 seconds. Um, we move the fish, the pair of fish to the other side of the stage, give, uh, raise the screen again, give infants 20 seconds of looking at the same fish again. Then in test trials, what we found, what we did was there was two different types of test trials. In the first test trial, it was the same fish again per, um, on one side of the stage and this alligator and a pig on the other side of the stage. And what we did is infants got to vote with their eyes. They either looked at the ones on the left or the ones on the right. And we coded that after, um, and, uh, you know, afterwards. There was a second test trial where if the 
um, infants truly abstracted the relation of same or different, they should be able to map it onto brand new objects, okay? So in this case, we've got a representation of same and a representation of different. Um, and so you would expect that if they saw fish at the beginning, they should also look longer at this dog and dragon uh, pair over here compared to the two frogs. Um, the other half of the infants were familiarized to different relation, and you would expect the opposite pattern here, that they would now look at these two test trials significantly more often. Okay, so here's what we found. The only significant difference that we found was for infants that were habituated or familiarized to same, they look significantly longer at different in the first test trial. All of the other test trial types were not significantly different from chance. Now, this is similar to the results that Terrell et al. found. However, back in 1991, when they did the statistics, they collapsed across all of these. They didn't differentiate between the sort of um, concrete and the abstract test trials. They collapsed across all of them. Lo and behold, they did get a significant difference, but we're calling that into question because when you separate the test trials by abstract versus concrete, there's a different potential explanation for this. So in short, we failed to re uh, replicate the Terrell et al. study. There was no evidence that infants encode an abstract same different relation from a single exemplar. So, um, so what this incurs is that there's no evidence that same different is innately present, that first of the three possibilities I presented at the beginning. So next, we wanted to test a, um, so, so, you know, do we just stop here? No, we don't say, oh, well, it didn't work. We're going to go home now. Um, it, it raises a question of, does this mean that infants are actually incapable of learning the relation? We think not, but we wanted to use a different method to ask the infants whether or not they could abstract this relation. So next we tested the second position of the three theor theoretical positions that I put out there, which is whether infants are capable of learning the abstract relation in the first half of the experiment and generalizing it to new objects in the second half um, through a process of structural alignment. Okay, so in this experiment, our question was, um, what is the earliest evidence that we can find of relational learning? Can infants learn the same different relation? Does the ability have, um, we also wanted to ask sort of a more nuanced question of, if they can learn it, does it have the same signatures that have been found in research on children and adults with regard to relational learning or analogical um, structure? So this particular um, uh, signatures that we were looking for was facilitation from multiple exemplars, like I showed you before with the preschoolers, and interference from um, attention to individual objects. So the way that we did this is we tested 32, 7, and 32, 9-month-olds. Um, we used a habituation dishabituation paradigm. So this is something where you get uh, you teach them something in the first half of the experiment, and you test how they generalize it in the second half of the experiment. We give them four exemplars. Um, uh, during this learning phase. And then in test trials, the dependent variable was duration of looking. Um, and there's three different types, types of test trials that have sort of um, ways of testing these signatures that we've seen in other analogical learning um, tasks. All right, so um, just to give you some pictures of how this works so it's easier to um, imagine. Um, Half of the children were habituated to same. They saw pairs of objects that were either AA, BB, CC, DD. I will show you the actual objects in a minute. It's just that all of us are literate, and so it's easier for us to think with letters. Um, then in test trials, we showed six uh, test trials in sequence, and we um, alternated between pairs that were the same and pairs that were different. So if you were habituated to same and you got bored with that abstracted relation, you should look longer at the different um, test trials compared to the ones that were the same. The other half of the infants were habituated to different and we'd expect the opposite pattern of looking during test trials for them. I hope this sort of makes sense. Are there any questions so far? Should I pause? No, okay, I'm gonna keep going. All right, so just to give you an idea, I mean, all of you are very good with thinking with letters. This is what the individual objects look like that we were showing the kids. So in a particular trial, the two pink blocks in this little trial right here would be presented on the stage when the screen went up, they would be raised up, they'd tilt to one direction, they'd tilt to the other direction, they'd go back down again. And that motion would continue until the infant looked away for two consecutive seconds or until the trial lasted for a full minute. And then we would end the trial. Um, so, they saw several different examples of same. Um, the, about half of the objects had eyes. They were different geometric shapes and contours. Some were furry, some were smooth. Um, and so 
basically what we wanted to do was vary all of the perceptual features so that if they actually detected this relation, the only relation, the invariance that they would pull out of this would be a relation of same. So um, basically what we found was that, um, so one of the gold standards of relational learning is if you have truly abstracted this relation, you should be able to map it onto objects you've never seen before. So as you can see here, if you're habituated to same, you saw A's and B's and C's and D's, but you've never seen XX or YZ before. And what happened was that infants looked significantly longer at the novel relation. So if they were habituated to same, it meant they look longer at YZ. If they were habituated to different, it meant they look longer at XX. So that's really cool. This is clear evidence that they can map it onto, that they abstracted the relation because they can map it onto new objects. So um, the multiple exemplars help facilitate learning the relation. Now, does object focus hinder? So we want to see if we can, now that we've succeeded with teaching infants something, we want to see if we can prevent teaching or prevent learning. Um, so in this case, what we did is in the waiting room prior to the experiment, we would individually show objects. Um, we would hold the object in between the experimenter and the infant and we tap on the object and then we put it back down again. And we would do that with the next object and the next object. So they saw the objects for like five or six seconds. Um, they didn't touch the objects. They just got a quick view of a variety of different objects. So what was interesting here is let's say they saw the object R in the waiting room. They don't see R at all during habituation. And then the next time they see R, it is part of this relation in a pair during test trials. Okay. So what this means is if they, if object focus, gets them to focus on the individual, not the relation, then they may fail to abstract the relation and they would look equally at these two test trials. And lo and behold, that's what we predicted, that we would hinder learning. And lo and behold, we did hinder learning. There was no significant difference between these two types of test trials. Now, as an evil developmental psychologist who is trying to hinder learning of these poor infants, I'm also interested in remediating. So what we did next is we showed the infants an object in the waiting room, but as an individual. And then we showed them the object as a pair in habituation trials. So they get to focus at the individual, but then they get a try, you know, multiple trials where they see this object in a relational pair. So the idea here is that um, can they get over this object focus by seeing it in a pair multiple times? And so then they see it again at test trials. Would they look longer at BC after habituation to same or vice versa for habituation to different? And lo and behold, we did remediate the children. So that's good. Um, so what we take from away from this, uh, this experiment and this paper in general is that alignment of multiple exemplars facilitates relational abstraction. And that having the multiple exemplars was important because in experiment one, they only saw one exemplar and they failed to learn. But in experiment two, they saw four exemplars repeatedly and they did show evidence of learning the relation. Um, another thing that's interesting is that in th this experiment, we found equivalent performance if you're habituated to same or habituated to different. So what's cool about that is that many of us in the lab and many of you maybe have the intuition that learning same should probably be easier than learning different. And we have no evidence to support that. The kids that were habituated to different were statistically not distinguishable from when the ones who were habituated to same. Um, we also have evidence that object focus disrupts relational learning. This is the second signature that um, we've seen in research on children and adults. And all told, these um, show the earliest signs of relational learning found um, you know, in, in young infants. Infants as young as seven months of age can detect a same or different relation and map it onto new exemplars. So, um, there's one additional experiment that's not published yet that I want to tell you about. Um, so we want to conclude that when you're shown one exemplar, you don't learn. But there are also a critical difference between our first and our second experiment that I just described to you. In the Terrell et al. Uh, thing that we failed to replicate, we were using a preferential looking task. And in the one where we found success, we were using a habituation dishabituation task. So these are different methods and maybe that's what accounted for our results. So if that's true, if we show one exemplar using the successful habituation dishabituation paradigm with seven and nine month old infants, they maybe they'll succeed. That was the next question. We wanted to be fair to the Terrell literature. 
And so what we did is we habituated seven and nine month old infants to a single exemplar using the paradigm that I told you just before. So this should be easy to understand now. We either show them only AA throughout habituation or only BC, separate group of infants, and then the exact same test trials that we showed you before. And these are the results. Basically, there was no learning in the critical gold standard trial. They did not abstract the relation and map it onto new objects. Um, in this one, this is the one where we showed it in the waiting room, um, gave them that individual object focus. So we predicted that it shouldn't, they shouldn't learn and they didn't learn. But if you don't have a significant difference between these two, I'm not gonna make a big deal about that. Um, um, although we do know that our methodology was sound because if you show an infant AA a bunch of times, and then you give them an opportunity to look at AA versus BC, they're gonna look significantly longer at BC and vice versa if they're habituated to different. So the paradigm seems to be testing something, but this isn't anything more than just recognizing something you've seen before. I don't think this is evidence of abstracting the relation. Okay, so. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. If you wanna, I can read it out for you. Um, yeah, why don't you read it out for me because I'm opening the chat as we speak. Okay. So comparing experiment one and two, would it be possible that infants just take longer to reach habituation? How do you judge whether it was habituation and learning? You answer that. Trying to do two things at once and I can't find the question. Hang on. How come I can't see the question? It's under Q&A. Oh, it's oh in the Q &A. thank you. I was, I'm not used to such fancy stuff. Okay. Experiment one and two, would it be possible that infants just take longer to reach habituation. Um, oh, so I think, did you ask this question a minute ago? Because I think that is a great question, but I think that this actually answers it because here in this experiment, we fully habituated them. So they met the habituation criterion and therefore it, um, when they didn't learn in this case, is that answering your question? Soon, if I'm not understanding you, just please unmute and answer. Maybe they can't unmute. Um, anyways, I'm gonna just move on, but, but I think my question, um, that's why I added this experiment in, which is they, um, that they did habituate with one exemplar here. They met the criterion and they still didn't learn. And so it shows that, that that's the, the methodology is fine. It's um, it's that they're just they need multiple exemplars to abstract the relation. Um, Can I a ask a, a, a question yeah. since you've just been interrupted? <laughs> um, so no, what if right. um, what if you test older kids for the one shot exposure? I think they'll still get bored. I have an interesting answer for what if you test younger kids, and I'm going to get to that at the end. Let's okay. say, but um, but. Basically, what a, yeah, I'm going to get to it at the end. So remind me again at the end if I don't circle back to it. All right. Anybody else? Yes, I got it. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. All right. <laughs> I'm glad we're communicating clearly. That's what's important to me. Um, again, please interrupt. And Apoorva, you're in charge for stopping me if other people don't interrupt me. All right. Um, so I want to revisit these uh, three possibilities again. Our failure to replicate the Terrell et al. experiment runs counter to this idea that same different is part of a pre existing set of core relations. But just because we couldn't find evidence of it doesn't necessarily rule it out. I don't want to draw conclusions from negative data. Um, our finding that seven and nine month olds can distinguish same different after experience a series of you know, four exemplars argues um, against this third position here, which is you need language or you need the advantages confirmed by, you know, uh, symbolic thought or combinatorial um, abstract processes. So I'm, I'm supporting that these data um, provide the most support for the second position here. Um, now, our next study tested for relational abstraction at an early age. People could do sort of a hand-waving complaint that, um, well, seven and nine-month-olds have been around a lot of language. They're definitely showing some language abilities by this age. And so what we did in our next study was to go to the earliest age possible for using looking paradigms um, in hopes that it would serve as a base for capturing developmental changes in this learning process. So three month olds are the earliest age that you can test with looking paradigms. And the reason it's the earliest age is that the infants need to have the motoric neck strength to be able to look at the stage and to look away from the stage. So, um, so that's what we did next. Okay. 
Um, so when looking at younger infants, we ask, can three month olds learn the same different relation? Um, are the learning patterns consistent with what we found in the older infants? And is comparison really the path to generalization? So let me unpack that part a little bit. One argument could be that if you gave four exemplars to seven and nine month old infants, you should probably give more exemplars to younger infants, maybe six, um, because the, you know many of these learning theories predict that breadth of training predicts breadth of transfer. So give the younger kids more because they need more support because they're younger and their processing mechanisms are less mature and things like that. Another argument is less is better. So if you've been around three month olds, it's no vast achievement to overwhelm a three-month-old. So um, one could make the argument that decreasing the variability and giving fewer exemplars um, while learning the relation, uh, you know, so that decreasing the variability of the objects while learning the relations improves their ability to detect um, that relation at test trials. So um, these are two different points of view, and um, there's data to back up both of these views. Um, the structure mapping interpretation or prediction is that it depends. It depends on whether or not there is an ability to align the, the objects that you're comparing. So you have to take into account the knowledge base of the participants. What I mean by that, and again, this is going back to Patrick's question, is like, well, what if the kids were older? If they, you know, they know more things, maybe they would do well with one exemplar. Um, Another way to think about it though, is that, well, if you overwhelm the kid and they're just processing all these different objects, they don't have any cognitive budget left to process the relation. So maybe the key would be give them fewer exemplars, but then what's gonna happen is that they will use up a portion of their cognitive budget processing the first exemplar and the second exemplar, but they need repetition. They need the ability to be like, oh yeah, it's those pink blocks again, I get it. Huh, look, both those pink blocks are the same as each other something along those lines. So that's an empirical question. And that's the empirical question that we tested. One side was greater variability. We tested 32 three month olds and they got six exemplars. And the other group was greater repetition and they got two exemplars. So let me show you how this actually plays out. As you can see here, it's the same rubric as before. You've got A, the difference here for six exemplars is you got AA, BB, CC, DD, EE, FF. Um, I'm not going to go through the ones with different, but the idea here is multiple exemplars. And then you, I have the same sort of nuance, different types of test trials as before. It's not really worth knowing all those different nuances because there is no learning. <laughs> These three-month-olds did not detect, did not discriminate between any of the test trials. They looked equally at all of them. So um, keep that in mind. And now let's go on to the two-exemplar story. So as you can see, the difference here is you've got AA, BB, AA, BB, AA, BB. So you have two exemplars, but you also have multiple opportunities of repetition, okay? So you can, um, maybe it takes you the first couple trials to process AA and then the objects in AA, then the objects in BB, but maybe by the second or third time you see AA, you start having enough cog cognitive budget left over to realize there's a relation between those two objects. Um, and I wouldn't be bothering you with these details if I didn't have a happy ending to tell you. So what we found was there was significantly longer looking at the novel relation um, when we presented them with new objects and test trials. Similarly, as we predicted, the um, uh, object experience should hinder performance, and it did. Um, the one thing that we found that was different between three-month-olds and the older infants that we've tested is that they're not so flexible. They don't recover as quickly as the seven and the nine-month-olds. So if you give them the individual object with this A at the beginning, even if you show them AA in uh, the habituation trials, they do not discriminate during test trials here. So the key point is they did generalize to new objects. They did um, get hindered by object experience um, however, one difference between these guys and the older infants is that they, they didn't recover as quickly. So there's a lack of flexibility than the older infants. So what we conclude from this is that relational learning is present in three month old infants. Comparison facilitates learning, object focus hinders learning. The other thing is that relational learning at three months is arguably evidence that it's happening prior to language. It suggests that language learning may capitalize 
Um, we know that language, learn, language labels help this learning later in development at three and four years of age. Um, and that it, um, so it's not to say that language doesn't do anything, but it is language is powerful and it's very helpful in um, analogical reasoning. However, at this very early age, it is not necessary to have a large lexicon to be able to perceive and abstract um, relations between objects. So um, it's uh, so what we can do is now sort of take stock. We have a whole bunch of examples here um, where we have shown that seven and nine month olds, if they're given one exemplar, it's not enough for them to abstract the relation, but with four exemplars, it is. At three months, two exemplars allows them to extract the relation, but six does not. So unlike non-human primates, there was very, in the successful cases, there was very little training that the infants were exposed to, as little as six to nine habituation trials. This is held in contrast to a large comparative literature where these um, non-human primates, as well as many other species, were given thousands, tens of thousands on, on occasion of trials um, before they could do a same different discrimination. So it raises a, another theoretical issue of whether or not preverbal infants, is it the case that, granted, it is just a number of trials. So is it that human infants and non-human primates, even if they do need a thousand trials to get up to snuff on the same different, is it just an expanding gap of what is the difference between their ability? Um, or is it that it's an incommensurable gulf? And it depends on how you interpret multiple trials. I think that the babies are picking this up um, unbelievably quickly. Some of my co-authors think that it is just an expanding gap. So um, these debates are still going on. We need to collect more data. Maybe our grant will get funded and we can do some of these experiments. Um, okay, so to return once again to this idea that how does human relational ability arise? Um, like we said before, our failure to replicate Terrell does not support this, but it doesn't rule it out. Our data do provide the most support for this. There is a innate learning mechanism, but the environment provides the relations that have to be abstracted. And I really do think that this last experiment sort of just allows us to really cross this one off the list, that relational processing developing through a combination of other abilities like language and culture is off the table now. If three-month-olds are doing it um, and it has similar signatures to what the older children are showing, we have made some progress in terms of these possibilities. All right, so to summarize, same and different relation has had perennial importance in our field. There's a quote from William James from 1890 saying, sense of sameness is the very keel and backbone of our thinking. I agree. I think over a hundred years later, these ideas are still important and critical to our understanding of our cognitive abilities. Um, having said that, we're not done yet. Um, there's still some key issues that remain controversial. One, whether or not possessing an inherent representation of, you know, do infants possess an inherent representation of same or different versus do they have the learning process that allows them, that allows the relation to be extracted from the input that they get from their environment. And again, further experiments will allow us to make progress on these questions. So these studies, studies show that same and different emerges independent of language, and it reveals because of these signatures of multiple comparisons and hindered by object focus, that there is a continuity through development. And lastly, I'd like to say thank you to my collaborators, my funding sources, um, the kids that participate in the studies, as well as all of the, the crew of the lab. And last but not least, always recruiting. If any of you have children, we would love for you to sign up for our studies. We have several different ages that we're testing online these days. Thank you.